Mario Kart 8 Deluxe has the most tracks in the Mario Kart franchise with a total of 48. These are all incredibly varied, ranging from old locations like Donut Plains 3 and new ones like Mount Wario. Having retro tracks is nothing new, however, something that does separate Mario Kart 8 Deluxe's track selection from its predecessors is the inclusion of tracks that aren't based on the Mario franchise. Excluding the Wii Sports Resorts tracks from Mario Kart 7. There are five tracks that come from outside the Mario franchise, those being Excitebike Arena based on Excitebike, Mute City and Big Blue from F-Zero, Hyrule Circuit based on The Legend of Zelda, and Animal Crossing based on uh, Fire Emblem, I think. These are each some of the most unique tracks in this title, and Nintendo went above and beyond when implementing these into the game. Welcome to the third episode of Level by Level, a series where I analyze specific levels from games. The last two episodes focused on Mario Odyssey, so I thought I should mix it up by picking a different title within a different genre. This episode will of course be different for that reason, but I also want to take a different approach with this one. When moving something over from one series to another, you can't just completely make stuff up to fulfill your needs. Whatever you're taking still has to feel like its original self adapted into a different place. Just looking at Smash Bros, for example, most of the characters there still feel like themselves. Despite being put in a fighting game, Isabel still feels very similar to how she is in the Animal Crossing titles, and Steve feels directly ripped straight from Minecraft despite fighting not really being what Steve is known for. On the other hand though, there are characters like Ganondorf, especially before Ultimate, that take almost nothing from their games and thus feel like an injustice, despite being much closer to fighting than the other two I mentioned. So how is Mario Kart 8 able to bring over five tracks from sometimes completely different genres and still make them all work as both race tracks and satisfying references to their home series? Well, that's what we're here to analyze today. Of course, these aren't perfect, and I'll also cover where I personally think they could have done something better. But anyways, if you enjoyed this video, please make sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel as it helps out a ton. But with that said, let's look at the five guest tracks from Mario Kart 8 Deluxe. I think it's fitting to start with the most basic track of the bunch, Excitebike Arena. Now I call it basic, but that does not mean it's bad, far from it in fact. This is my personal favorite track to play on of the five, and it was voted as the second best when I took a poll on it. The map is basically just a long baby park, or in other words, a long oval. In fact, if baby park wasn't here, this map would definitely have an argument for being the most simple in the game. However, I definitely think this basic layout helps sell its origin. Let's take a detour and look at the original Excitebike for the NES. Now luckily for Mario Kart, this series is already in the racing genre. This eh, sort of. See, it's more like a glorified time trial simulator as the racers in front of you aren't actual racers, they just act as obstacles. I mean, look here, several racers clearly finished in front of me and I still got first place. Aside from that, the gameplay is drastically different from Mario Kart. Mario Kart has a strong focus on turns and getting the most out of them, whereas Excitebike doesn't have any turns at all. In fact, the only real way that you'll be gaining or losing time is by using the ramps lining the course. Your whole objective in Excitebike is to get the absolute most from every jump you can to get the best possible time. Getting a super fast trick off of a ramp feels incredibly satisfying, however messing up, well, it feels a lot less satisfying. I think that feeling of flying through the air off of ramps is captured perfectly in Mario Kart's rendition. I'm not exactly sure if it's just because of the angle, but I think you get way more air off these ramps than any other in the game. For that reason, whenever I think of this track, I associate it with flying through the air from a big jump. Actually, speaking of flying, I think it's also important to mention that there are no glider ramps nor anti-gravity segments on this track. It may seem bizarre to mention that, but this is actually the only original track to have neither a glider ramp, anti-gravity, or both. They could have easily put a glider ramp on one of the ramp types, but they didn't, and I actually think that was a really good choice. Personally, I feel like gliding would take away from the feel of the original Excitebike. The game was about jumping, not staying in the air. If they added in a ramp like this, then you could almost entirely skip what makes this track so much fun. Again, it might seem weird to compliment them for not doing something, especially when it seems so obvious, but Nintendo is prone to making dumb decisions sometimes. Jumping back into the ramps that are actually in the course though, they're all taken directly from the original Excitebike. Okay, I lied, it's not possible to place only one mud splat at a time, and it's also not possible to place a ramp in the middle like this. Terrible recreation, dislike. I'm only kidding, of course. I actually think these original ramp types add to the feeling of it being more like Excitebike, despite not actually coming from there. These booster ramps will give some of the highest jumps, just like in the original. However, I think putting them behind the mud also helps add on that feeling of dodging mud in the original title. Since there's only so much track they can work with, they likely didn't want to fill it up with so much mud. I think that would take away from the feeling of constantly jumping around the track. So in a way, making it less of a complete port made it feel more like the original game. There are also a few other obstacles that didn't make it over either, namely these short walls and long patches of grass. I think the same logic can be applied to these two as well. While putting them in would technically be more accurate, it would also take away from the feeling of constantly doing tricks off of ramps which feels closer to Excitebike. 
I'm sure some of you would rather have the tracks be as accurate as possible, but I think capturing the feel of the franchise is much more important. That's one of the reasons why I feel like Mario is one of the best represented characters in Smash, despite many of his moves not coming from his franchise, but that's a story for a different day. Now, if this were a normal track, that's where the analysis would come to an end. However, all of these tracks were given something unique that helped them stick out. In Excite Bike Arena's case, it was actually randomizing the layout. Yeah, if you didn't know, every time you play Excite Bike Arena, the obstacles will all be in completely different locations. The only exception is in time trials, of course. That way you wouldn't have to get lucky to get a good time, and of course so the ghost wouldn't be able to go through walls and fly off of nothing. Well, I mean, they are ghosts, so I guess it wouldn't be that weird. But anyways, I find this choice to be pretty interesting. The tracks in the original game, as far as I can tell, aren't randomized. However, I think this choice may have been made to replicate the really weird stage builder the game used to have. Yeah, you could make custom stages in the original game, but every time you turned off your console, it'd get erased, so what was the point there? But I actually think that this randomization also helps sell the feel as well. Excitebike is not known for its tracks. Once again, it's known for its jumps. This randomization helps keep that focus on these jumps and helps keep the track fresh. It makes you have to think quickly instead of having the track memorized perfectly during races. So overall, I genuinely think this is a perfect reference to the original. No, it's not my absolute favorite track in the game, but it does what it sets out to do perfectly. Heck, the look of the track is perfect as well, ripping the color scheme from the first tracks. Let me just say I'm glad the colors aren't random because man those later tracks are ugly. The red and white colors and pixel art lining the track is just phenomenal. I love how the start also has these little guys holding you back at the start just like the original title despite not having any gameplay function. Speaking of the start, the side angled camera shot in the opening to replicate the original game's camera, just perfect. And also the music is an absolute banger, but that's not really a surprise considering Mario Kart 8 has one of the best soundtracks of all time without a doubt. Anyways, I'll focus a bit more on art direction for the others. Excitebike Arena was more simple though, so I thought I'd save it for the end. I genuinely can't think of anything wrong with how they ported this track over. I agree with pretty much every decision they made, so for that, I'm putting it in S tier for capturing the feeling of Excitebike perfectly. Oh yeah, I'm doing a tier list by the way. Okay, let's cover the two F-Zero tracks together. Mostly because they of course originate from the same franchise, but also because I want to compare these tracks with each other. I also want to say that I'm a lot less familiar with F-Zero than the other franchises in this video, so if I say something dumb, make sure to let me know. Like Mario Kart and sort of Excitebike, F-Zero is also a racing game, this time with actual opponents. I've only gotten to play the original on the SNES as of right now, but let me just say though, this is way better than the original Super Mario Kart. I don't know if that's a controversial opinion, but getting footage for this video was way more enjoyable than I thought it would be. The controls, especially for turning, are just much better. Anyways, having good controls obviously isn't the thing that makes F-Zero unique, especially since the other Mario Karts actually have those. No, I'd say there are three main things that separate these franchises, at least based on the original. First off, we have a stronger focus on driving itself. Mario Kart, of course, has items, however, F-Zero doesn't really. Races in that title aren't determined by luck, pretty much at all. The only luck you could argue for is computer AI, though if you're good enough, you shouldn't really have to worry about that. So how did Mute City and Big Blue go about implementing this? Well, in short, they didn't, but this is not a bad thing. I think if they removed all of the item boxes on the track, then these would have probably been the least liked maps in the game. Mario Kart's items are tied a lot closer to its identity than F-Zero's lack of them. Having the items does not prevent these tracks from feeling like they're from F-Zero, and so keeping them in was definitely a good decision, though I doubt they were even considering removing the items. Though you can play without items if you want to, so who really knows? The other two things are both implemented into the tracks in some way, those being F-Zero's power meter and its incredibly fast speed. Now that we've got what I consider to be the main appeals of F-Zero established, let's go ahead and see how the tracks themselves actually are. Now I'm not going to do a full-on analysis of any of these tracks' layouts, mostly because it's hard to do and it doesn't really help us much, so I'll only cover the highlights. Mew City is a three-lap course filled to the brim with boost panels. I'm not going to count it out on each track, but I'm fairly certain this has the highest amount of them in the game. Especially during the opening segment, you could just chain these one after another without slowing down. Not only that, but there are also anti-gravity boosters pretty much everywhere there aren't any dash panels. As a result, the speed on this track is unparalleled by any other. Especially when playing a 200cc, this feels like you're playing F-Zero. I think it's safe to say, they accomplished the whole going fast thing here very well. There is another track to compare to though, that being Big Blue. You only have to do one lap around this course, like Mount Wario and N64 Rainbow Road. I think having one of these be the standard 3 lap and having the other one be a 1 lap helps differentiate these from each other a lot. While yes they should still feel similar, they need to be different enough to justify them both being in the game. This is the only non-Mario franchise to get two tracks in Mario Kart 8, so they really have to make them feel at least a little bit different. 
These two definitely share a lot of elements, which we'll get into later, but they still make Big Blue quite unique. The start is very similar to Mute City with a ton of dash panels, before it moves you onto an obstacle that isn't in Mute City. You have to ride on the green path as it pushes you forward, whereas the red one would push you back. This track also includes two glider ramps, something Mute City didn't have any of. Lap 2 focuses on being in water that pushes the player forward, giving them just that little bit of extra speed. Lap 3 is the green and red obstacles again, along with the end splitting into two different paths. So overall, this course does feel quite a bit different than Mute City. It is a bit slower, however I think that decision was justified in order to make it more unique. Plus, a one lap course can't just be all boost panels, you have to mix it up a little bit to make it worth not just being a smaller three lap course. Big Blue uses other techniques on top of dash panels that make the player gain that speed that is integral in selling F-Zero's feel. Speed isn't the only thing though, both of these tracks are given special properties to further sell the feel of their original titles. I think the main and most obvious special trait of these two courses is that they entirely take place in anti-gravity mode. The only other track to be like this is in Baby Park, which was done there to make it more chaotic. It was given to these tracks here though, mostly because that's exactly how the F-Zero tracks are. While all the courses in the original SNES are flats, likely due to hardware, the following titles have much more insane track design. Especially looking at Big Blue and F-Zero X, the anti-gravity is fully on display. The tracks in F-Zero are supposed to be insanely designed like this in order to further its feel. So obviously having these tracks be in anti-gravity was an obvious and easy decision to make. Due to Mario Kart 8's rendition of anti-gravity though, I do feel it slightly takes away from part of F-Zero. A very important part of that game to me was avoiding hitting stuff, as it would take away from your power meter. If your power meter runs out, let's just say Captain Falcon won't be racing for a while. This would include other players. In Mario Kart 8, however, you are given a slight speed boost whenever you hit another player. I'm very mixed about this, on one hand it helps sell the speed as you'll get a speed boost every time you touch someone, however on the other hand it takes away from part of the intensity I felt in the SNES title. This is really just a personal nitpick though, if it's even an issue at all. I'm personally quite conflicted on how I feel about it. Speaking of the power though, these are technically the only tracks to not have any coins on them. You can still get them from item boxes, so don't worry coin item fans that apparently exist. Instead of being placed on the track, we have a bunch of these guys that will grant you coins as long as you're on top of them. In the original series, these acted as a way to refuel your power, so having them give you coins here is a great way to make these tracks closer to the original series. One last thing that many players might not know about these tracks is that they actually have underwater physics. That means your characters will fall a lot slower than normal here, along with having more controllable descents. Not only does it seemingly fit pretty well, this physics change makes for one of the most memorable shortcuts in this title. In Big Blue, depending on your CC and if you used a mushroom, you could take a giant leap across the section in lap 2. I don't believe for a second that this large of a cut was intentional, however something being unintended is far from a bad thing. This is one of the highlights in the game for me and many others. You can also do some floating on Mute City as well, though I'm not entirely sure if this is actually faster, but I have a lot of fun doing it regardless. Alright, so now we have to talk about their aesthetic choices being their music and visuals. Visually, these tracks look similar to each other, but different at the same time. Mute City is of course more closed in, taking place in, well, a city. Also a little fun easter egg, if you look at the screens you can see it says show me your moves, which is just a fun little reference to Captain Falcon's most iconic appearances, the Smash series. I mean, it's obviously not F-Zero at this point. Big Blue, on the other hand, has its background much more varied and out in the open. Due to this being a much longer journey, they were able to squeeze in many more unique locations. One huge part of these tracks is their music. As I said, Mario Kart 8 Deluxe is one of the best soundtracks ever, and these are no exception. Especially the Big Blue Remix. One nice thing they did here was give the results a special theme based on F-Zero. There's only one other track that does this, which we'll talk about later, but it just helps further sell its unique feel. The beginning also has a unique jingle from Ref Zero, and these are the only tracks that have something unique here. Audibly, they really went above and beyond to make these tracks feel so much like their home series. But that leaves an important question. Which did it better? Well, in my personal opinion, I think Mute City is the better reference to F-Zero, but Big Blue is the better track. Mute City just feels faster to me, and that's what I see as the most important thing to capture. However, I find Big Blue's shortcut and length to be much more fun to race on. Either way, they're both pretty close to each other in both aspects. 
Now as for the overall tier list, however, I'm going to have to place these just under Excitebike. Now I perfectly understand why some people will put these higher, but there are just a few small things about these tracks that put them away from being at the very top. First off, they aren't as one-to-one -one as Excitebike Arena was to Excitebike. Now I know I said that being one-to-one -one isn't what's important, however I feel like these tracks are missing part of that intensity from the original F-Zero. They obviously have the speed down perfectly, however, I don't feel like I need to worry as much about sloppy driving in Mario Kart 8 as opposed to F-Zero. I feel like I can still hit walls and generally be alright, whereas it can lead to your elimination in F-Zero. Now, I'm obviously not asking for players to be eliminated during a race, that's not what Mario Kart is. I do think there should be some extra punishment for hitting walls, though. I think if touching a wall or player took some of your coins, that would be a good incentive to drive at least a little bit better. This would also help further replicate the power mechanic through coins as you would lose power upon touching walls in the original. Yes, this is a very minor problem in two tracks that emulate the series they're referencing near perfectly. However, when its competition is pretty much without flaws, we have to separate them based off of that. I also personally enjoy racing on Excitebike more, but that is definitely just my personal preference as Big Blue was the most popular course on my poll. Still, these two tracks do great jobs in not only representing F-Zero, but justify there being two separate tracks for the series. Two tracks left, Hyrule Circuit and Animal Crossing. What separates these two tracks from the last three is that their origin franchises do not fall anywhere near the racing genre. Let's look at The Legend of Zelda. This easily has the most games of any of the franchises mentioned here. The franchise does not require any introduction, while not quite as popular as Mario, it's certainly not far off. With there being so many titles though, it's hard to place them all in the exact same camp. Despite that though, I think there are two main things that can apply to most of the Zelda games in the main series. They're based on a large adventure with puzzle solving along the way. I guess you could argue combat as well. So, how does Hyrule Circuit do at conveying both of these themes? Well, let's look at the puzzle solving aspect first because I actually think this does a perfect job at representing this aspect of the franchise. If I were to ask you what is the most memorable thing about this track besides it being based on Zelda, I feel like a majority of you would say the interior with the boost ramp to the Master Sword. That's because this ramp will only appear every so often, and thus it feels really satisfying when you're able to take it, and also really funny when someone just misses it and runs into the wall instead. I'm sure most of you know this, but the ramp here is actually activated by the three anti-gravity boosters in the staircase before here. Once you know this, you're able to use this to your advantage to summon the ramp right when you need it almost every single time. Unlike other boosters in the game, these will give a distinct new look once activated. Once all three of them are hit, the puzzle solving jingle from Zelda will play. That way, you as the player are able to connect the dots from there that hitting all of them will do something, that of course being triggering the ramp. Sure, it's not a complicated puzzle, but I think it's perfect for the Mario Kart series. Not only is it simple enough to figure out while zooming past them, it's still a decent challenge to complete once you know it's there, due to the boosters giving you, well, a speed boost, which can make it hard to control your cart. There aren't really any other puzzles like this in the game, which I think helps this track stand out, even if it's just a small bit. This goes a long way in helping display that this does indeed come from the Zelda series. Speaking of displaying where this comes from, a super obvious change that was made for this track specifically was replacing the coins with rupees. This is obviously the currency of the Zelda franchise, so having the coins changed to represent it is a perfect small little addition. They even changed the item itself. Along with coins, piranha plants on the tracks are replaced by Deku Babas. My first nitpick with the track has got to be that the piranha plant item itself wasn't changed. I think it would have been really neat if it were. In fact, I think they could have changed a few others as well. The boomerang flower could have been a boomerang from the series, but bombs could have been designed closer to Link's bombs or bomb chews, and so on. Again, this is a nitpick, and not really an issue, just would have been neat to see more of. On the topic of more aesthetic elements, we might as well cover the rest of that now. The item boxes give off a Zelda-themed jingle. The only other tracks in the entire franchise to do that are Animal Crossing and Waluigi Pinball. The song itself is pretty good, not as good as the three tracks we talked about before, but it's still pretty nice, remixing several different tracks from the series. As far as I can tell, this course isn't based on any one Zelda game. Each game in the series takes place several years and sometimes even timelines apart with different links each time aside from the direct sequels. That means each one has a decently distinct set of characters with its land. Now I've only played about 8 Zelda games and of those I've only completed 2 of them so I'm not an expert by any means. As far as I can tell though, this is mostly just supposed to be a roundup of ideas from several titles. I think this track does a great job at not veering too closely to one title, which I definitely believe was their intention. This being the only Zelda track they added, I absolutely think this was the right decision to make in order for most Zelda fans to be satisfied. 
If they do decide to add more for Mario Kart 9, whenever that is, I think it would be fair to more closely tie it to a specific title. So aesthetically, this track does a great job at being Zelda. There is, however, one thing I personally find to be a bit disappointing about this track. I mentioned before that not only is puzzle solving important to the franchise, but so is going on a large adventure. In pretty much every game in the series, Link will travel to a multitude of different distinct locations. Even in the first Zelda on the NES, there are a few distinctly colored areas. I'm sure some of you can see where I'm going with this, but I personally feel like this track does not really feel like an adventure. It's purely focused on Hyrule Castle, which is of course the most iconic location in the series. I do feel though that ignoring the other distinct locations besides leaving them as backgrounds hurts this track. If I were behind this, I would have personally given this the one lap treatment. Like Big Blue, it would have allowed for an exploration of several different places from the series, thus making the track feel much more like an adventure. Mount Wario feels much more like a journey than the track based on quite possibly the most iconic adventure game series. Now obviously, one lap tracks are harder to develop as you can't reuse the same locations multiple times. These tracks are going to be much bigger in size, not necessarily in length of time, but development wise they definitely are. For that reason, this issue is forgivable, though I can't really say this is a perfect representation of the Zelda franchise. My wish for the next Mario Kart is to have a Zelda track where you go between several of the unique locations offered there. There really aren't any other tracks that would transition between several different landscapes like how I would envision this, which would make this much more unique. So I'm going to be placing this in the next tier down from the F-Zero tracks. While I do find this to be a decent flaw, this track is a lot of fun to drive on with nice cuts through several bits of grass. The puzzle in the staircase also fits it perfectly. Along with the large amount of aesthetic references to the series, I still think this does a great job. I just personally think that the concept could have been improved. One more track to go, that being Animal Crossing. Of the franchises we've covered, this is probably the one I'm most familiar with. So, what is Animal Crossing? Well, I'm sure I don't have to answer that considering New Horizons sold so much. Though it was never able to pass Mario Kart 8 Deluxe, which means there are some of you who don't know about it. It's basically a life simulation game in a village filled with animals. Alright, how do you capture a life simulation game in a racing game? Well, the truth is, you sort of can't. Despite that, I think they were able to focus on the main selling point behind the franchise, the village itself. Now, this may seem like a super obvious decision, like of course they're going to base the track on the one location you go to, but that's not exactly what I mean. Animal Crossing is all about you living in a town, as I said, so roaming all around and getting to know that town is a fundamental part of that game. I think this track absolutely nails that. Every single type of location is covered here. You start off crossing a bridge to a bunch of fruit trees. Then you go flying into a plaza area that has a fountain and a lot of buildings. Then you of course go to the beach which is an Animal Crossing staple, before ending off going across another bridge to finish the lap. Along with the track following an Animal Crossing town layout, pretty much every building from New Leaf is located somewhere on the track. I mean, I feel like you get more distinct locations in this map than in Hyrule Circuit. Pretty much every important part of an Animal Crossing village is in this track. So while they couldn't really do a life sim in a kart racer, this was the next best thing. Okay, well what I said wasn't necessarily completely true though, as they did implement one aspect of the life sim, that being the seasons. Animal Crossing games are well known for running in real time, so it will be the same time in the game as it is for you outside of it. That goes for the seasons as well, which they decided to carry over for this track. Every time you play it, the seasons will randomly be selected from summer, fall, winter, or spring. Each one of them has a slightly different layout. Summer has several extra ramps placed on the beach and you can knock down fruit from the trees to get a boost. This is also the only one used in time trials. Fall has several piles of leaves that will dispense out items. Winter makes the track slightly more slippery. Additionally, snow boys are placed as obstacles on the track and Mr. Rossetti isn't present. Finally, spring has extra ramps placed in Rossetti's area. Each of the seasons will also take place at different times of day. This is another small nitpick, but I think it would have been nice if the time of day was determined by your console's clock since it's purely visual. Smashville and Town and City do that in Smash, so I think it would have been nice here. Regardless though, having different seasons gives this track its own unique feel that fits Animal Crossing as a series perfectly. One flaw in this system though is that you can't choose which season you want to play in. I feel like having some sort of button combination to choose, at least for local races, would have been nice. You also can't do time trials on any of the other seasons, which I think is a bit of a shame. Obviously, I understand this decision, but I just would have wished there would have been separate time trials for the other seasons. On top of having the seasons though, this track is filled to the brim with references to the original series. I think this might just have more than any of the others, so let's rapid fire through a bunch of them. The coins are replaced by bells on this track, it's a very subtle difference, but a nice one nonetheless. Item boxes will give off a unique jingle just like Hyrule Circuit. 
Speaking of items, the item boxes being tied to balloons is also a great reference to presents being attached to balloons in the main series. Hitting one of the rocks at the ends will spit out bells, just like the series' infamous money rocks. The results also have their own unique theme like the F-Zero tracks. That's not even close to all of them, but I'm sure you get the picture. While I don't think a track can be carried by just references like this, they certainly help this track feel much more satisfying. As for its placement on the tier list, I think I'm going to place it just above Hyrule Circuit. This captures the feel of Animal Crossing a bit better, along with having a few more references. However, not being able to select the seasons kinda stung, and on top of that, I just don't find this one as fun to race on as the others. It feels much more basic in comparison without any real racing highlights. Excitebike Arena has the big jumps, Mute City and Big Blue have the speed, and Hyrule Circuit has the ramp puzzle and a few pretty fun cuts. This one just doesn't really have any of that. If I weren't an Animal Crossing fan, I could even see this being placed a bit lower, not to mention that this track's music is easily the weakest. Still very good, but come on, it's got nothing on Big Blue. So, reference-wise, it's a good deal better than Hyrule Circuit, but layout-wise, it's a bit weaker. The most exciting thing you can really do on this track is cutting through the last turn, which isn't really that huge. Still a solid track, though. It's pretty equal with Hyrule Circuit at the moment because they both specialize in different things. So. If that was the last track, why is there still so much time left in this video? Well, since we're on the topic of crossovers in Mario Kart 8 Deluxe, we might as well cover Urchin Underpass since I likely wouldn't cover it by itself. With the addition of the Inklings as playable characters, it only made sense that they would have a chorus based on their home series. With Mario Kart 8 Deluxe fixing the monstrosity that was Mario Kart 8's battle mode, they needed to add in some new courses. I think having a Splatoon map as a battle course instead of a racetrack fits perfectly. It's a multiplayer game where you fight others online within an arena, which is why making this a battle course was the best choice. They also gave it some of its own unique features like coins that I didn't actually know were changed before getting footage for this video, and their own unique item roulette sound. As a battle map, I mean it's alright. It's kind of cramped at parts, but it's decent. I won't ever be choosing it over Battle Course 1, Woohoo Town, or Dragon Palace though. Some of the nitpicks I have with the course is the fact that the ink doesn't change color ever. That seems like such an obvious and easy change to make playing this feel at least a little bit less repetitive. Another choice I found strange was not giving this a unique ending theme. Like, this seems like such an obvious choice for having one, especially compared to Animal Crossing. I mean, Splatoon has a match ending theme, they could have just used that. Maybe they were tight on time since they probably wanted to get this game on the Switch as soon as they could, but it's just the small things I would've liked to see. Still, it being a battle course instead of a racetrack fits Splatoon very well. I do feel like it has a lot of missed potential though, so it's going to be at the bottom of the list. But anyways, that's it for Level by Level Episode 3. Are you all mad that I didn't consider the Donkey Kong tracks outside of the Mario franchise? Let me know in the comments. So you all may have noticed that this video was a bit slow to make. I'm starting school again, so uploads are going to be a little bit less frequent, though I'm going to try to spend most of my free time making them for you all. I'd appreciate it if you hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. Level by Level is currently my favorite video series on the channel, and I really like having the freedom to make what I want. Speaking of, at the end of every episode, I'm going to include a tier list comparing all of the levels I've covered so far, so here it is. We got our first S tier with Excite Pike, which is nice to see. Don't be surprised if I slightly update this between episodes, by the way. But anyways, Dry Bones for Smash, and I'll see you guys next time.